Hello, I'm Dr. Leah Gibbons. I'm with the Regenerative Living Institute and Porter Collaborative, and so you can visit our websites and reach out to us there. And my guest today is Brandon Yarborough, who has a background in architectural design, um, engineering background, and holds state certified general contractor licenses, which enables him to build anything. It's an unlimited license. So he's brilliant. He's able to incorporate and pull together a lot of different things to really create, you know, thing, buildings and structures that, I mean, I've never met anybody better at this. So it's great to have him today to share with us. And this is what we're talking about, natural and regenerative building. And I want to just remind people since, um, you know, every, people come to these talks at different places, you haven't seen the previous ones probably, that our framework is really around communities. And when we say community, we mean, we mean a biogeocultural living system. So this is humans and all of the rest of life as well, as well as those geochemical components, you know, like water and air, rocks, minerals, that sort of thing. And all these things interact to create life, right? So we really have to have like a community mindset to be working regeneratively because we, we want to create the conditions for more life. Um, and we're really interested in the flows in these communities. So we define community as a system in which there are strong flows and relationships that synergize to create life. And outside of that boundary that we artificially create of community, the flows are less strong. So less influential. And for the humans, you know, we want to develop a really deep connection to our place and our community. And we want to have a mindset or a consciousness of maximum beneficial impact. So like, how can we be catalysts for life, all life to thrive in our communities? And so we work across scales. There's us as an individual, and we're always trying to be more regenerative in ourselves. Um, and then we're part of the community and communities are parts of landscapes and cities and regions and so on. So this is how we can catalyze change upscale and change occurs downscale as well, but mostly the change can be catalyzed with innovative, um, let's say developments upscale because the higher level scales like regions and so on, they tend to maintain a certain order and they change much more slowly, whereas at the lower levels, like geographically lower, smaller levels, change can happen much more quickly. And when the change is beneficial to all life, it will cascade up scale. And this is when we get bioregional change and so on and global change. And so as regenerative practitioners, this is really the kind of change we're working for. Because those, like I said, those big scales change slowly and it's not, it's necessary to work on those scales, but um, maybe not the best use of everyone's efforts, right? Certainly some people are called to that and thank goodness for those people. <laughs> but a lot of us wanna see change much more quickly. So we're working on these smaller scales. Okay, and I'm gonna hand it off to Brandon now and he's gonna talk about natural and regenerative building because obviously we need structures to live in and work in and things like that. And so we can think of buildings as, as these smaller scales like the side scale, the individual scale where they can serve the larger communities they're a part of in some very specific ways. And so I'll hand it over to Brandon. All right. Well, hello first. Uh, yeah, give you a little background on how natural building has been effective towards increasing people's knowledge of community, of resource use and interaction. You can see in these photos, anything from very conventional on the bottom left, this is a cob structure in, in England. And then you can go all the way over to the top right, it's called the mushroom house. And uh, so you got everything in between. Where I come from, I learned in a very conventional way to begin with my first, you know, forays into construction were new construction and renovation in the conventional world. And once I satisfied an unlimited license, started kind of hobbying into what I really enjoyed as a child and as a young man, nature, and combining the two. So when I go into natural building, I'm bringing in the expertise of code you know, requirement knowledge, of structural knowledge, of conventional building practices, but then 
bringing natural materials in to substitute, to change, to even make it better. And we'll get into some of the specifics about how natural materials and methods can make a structure a thriving structure versus just a structure that can sometimes make you sick. Um, let's see. It's, it's, it's an important technology within a larger regenerative development process. It's not, albeit, but it's just a part of it. Uh, conventional building practices can be very destructive to the environment and also create a, a, a long-term negative um, situation. And we can get into some of those specifics if you'd like to, but if you already know it, we don't need to. Things like you know, the toxic materials, the, the methods in which some materials like gypsum, drywall gypsum, entire ecosystems are wiped out for a one, two, three yard layer of gypsum. The center of the state of Florida is devastated by gypsum mining. We know this, Leah was a restoration ecologist for about a year, a little less than a year down there. And I would go out to some of these sites and it looked like a, a alien planet or it looked like a war zone of, on mass scale. As far as you could see, the landscape was just destroyed. And they had machinery out there that was just going at it with very little intention of trying to put it back like it was. It would do the minimum to you know, get some grass growing, a few trees planted, and then go to the next devastating area. But it uh, seemed to me at the time, every time I saw those things, it's so much destruction for so little gain. And then it never, I mean, in our lifetimes, would never be the same ecosystem or anywhere close to it. They would say restored only because there's some things growing. But it was, if we all know, the, the microbiome, the, the life connections there have been disrupted for a long, long time, longer than our lifetimes. It's, so looking at natural building practices, going to the place and, and being able to create healthy environments or actually go into a healthy environment and just add another layer where humans can interact with it and it be thriving for both the environment that exists and the human interaction. At any time you want to add something, please do. Yeah, I just want to add that, and Brandon can elucidate on this also, the building materials used in conventional building are highly toxic for humans. They have gotten better recently, but uh, when I first got into this field with Brandon, it was, I mean, just like the glues used in a lot of materials, highly, highly toxic. <laughs> and that's just like the first layer of the toxic materials used. So for human health alone, like conventional building is very, very damaging. But then like he was saying, there's the whole environmental component as well, which is very damaging. It, it was, I believe, in a, just at the turn of century when formaldehyde was removed from the glue processes for plywood, cabinetry, subfloors, wall systems, you name it. And when you think of a new house that's got walls, cabinets, floors, all the connected stuff with formaldehyde-based glues, and you then go there and let's say you have a, a newborn child or you're pregnant and you end up growing a child in, <clears throat> in that environment, that's a highly toxic environment for seven to 15 years of off-gassing. Not good. Now, some of that's kind of unavoidable if you want to build certain things, certain looks, certain structures, but you can minimize that to the point where it's negligible. Um, one of the projects I'll talk about is one that I did here just a few years ago in Chapel Hill with Dr. Danny Moad, EcoHeal, and you can look that website up and see some of these structures. Maybe if you want to pull that up, we can Let's get to that a little bit later. Talk about what, what is natural building, yeah. Brandon? What, what can you define building? it for us? <laughs> so using resources in place. One thing is when I start to plan a project, and I'll, I'll liken this to one I'm about to start. We're going to do a 200-acre development in the Appalachian Mountains. And I, I break ground on that, my part, starting in July. Roadways have already started, but I'll get up there and start siting, um, you know, picking sites for structures. And I don't go in and say a site right there. We're going to build right there. I actually go in and I, I, I develop a bit of a, a communication and then get deeper and deeper with the land. I sit with it. 
I let it then start to talk to me. And I do have something that I've come to realize is, is rare, and that's vision. It, and most people don't have it, and that's fine. Uh, find somebody that does, work with them, and have them tell you what the land will support, what the land will hold, what will then help the land to thrive, and thus help the structure to thrive. When you get that image, when you get that knowledge, then you start to look around and say, okay, if it'll hold it, if it'll support it, and this will create a more thriving system, let's see what else would it contribute. So the land starts saying, okay, here, here, I have this. Here I am, here I am. Clay from the ground starts to show up, stone shows up, wood from the trees on site show up. And think about that, a tree that started as a seed 30 years ago, and now it's a 60 foot pine that most people would chop down, send to the paper mill, or in, in some cases, it gets put on a ship, sent all the way to China, chopped up, made into two by fours processed, and then shipped all the way back to the US and sold for four or five bucks for a piece of two by four. On site, we bring in a mobile mill and we will cut what we need, cure it on site, and then use it in the building project so it will live its entire life and then remain there as a fixed carbon in its home from now on. And that feels really good. We were able to um, identify a lot on this 200 acres that's uh, ripe for removal. And when you understand forestry and you've got the progression of the forest, you start to see what it's time for some things to come out. So utilize those in the building projects. I'm talking mostly about trees. So. So trying to get as many materials from on site as possible that are uh, from the earth, of the earth, yeah. and um, harvesting them or mobilizing them in ways that are, unfortunately, all we can say here is kind of not damaging, but a lot of times, especially in the U.S., I know this is kind of true of the West in general, the ecosystems we see have been very altered, mm -hmm. you know, from their original state, especially where we live, for example, uh, pretty much everything has been clear cut many times. Oh, yeah. So you see a lot of habitats that are very like pine heavy, which is not really uh, what they should be. That's very unnatural. So removing the pines is actually helpful to the ecosystem because it allows it to keep progressing and evolving, you know, in its natural, the way it naturally would. Mm -hmm. So this is a way that humans, again, can be like catalysts for the rest of life to thrive. It's like in this mountain top community, you know, we're going to be doing that selectively so that we can help the ecosystem, you know, keep progressing and growing because otherwise the pines will stunt the growth of the ecosystem and really change it in ways that are not beneficial. So we can, you know, use the pines and the building and help the ecosystem. So that's, you know, like a win-win. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and also as, as you identify what the place will support and it overlaps with what you desire to put there, now you've got to win. If, if it says it'll support something, but putting a, a 10 story high rise is just not going to happen, then yeah, you've got to listen to place. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen a lot when you see rural and even urban areas that get these mini malls or strip malls or large structures, but it may just come in and devastate the landscape, completely scrape it back and then build what they want. And then you've got a very artificial you know, environment and it really only services the needs, the immediate needs, not the long-term needs of human population. And that, that's happened a lot, so much that it's really affecting more than just that space. Can you tell us about how the building then will also, can also be health inducive for people? Sure. And we'll talk about the planet after the people. <laughs> I'll describe a rammed earth project that I did uh, with Dr. Danny. And this was a, a small meditation guest house. So when we did the mix for the rammed earth, we did a form and compaction mix that we incorporated uh, lime in the mix, as well as the earth from right there and created a bit of a crystalline stuck structure. So as it cures, and if you understand cement, there's a bit of a crystalline structure in cement from the line that's in there. But this, you could measure it. And after, these are 14 inch thick walls, 
They're nine feet high and they actually penetrate the foundation into the ground with a rubble base, stone base into the, the ground. So the ground temperature is pretty consistently 58 to 60 degrees. That temperature is brought through the entire structure, but that crystalline energy, it is again measurable and it's a negative ion field that you'd basically be sleeping in. And if you understand that, then you know that's a health inducive situation. Also, our stucco that we used, we used an earthen stucco, so a cob, a mix of uh, the, the soils, the, the minerals, the, the rocks right there on site, the clay, and gave this a really nice coat on the inside and the outside. So when people go into this structure, 100% of the time, they have comments like, this is amazing. This smells so good. This feels so good. I've never walked into a new house that felt like a hug. And it, it does. We, we did also uh, a natural rooftop. So we had 16 inches of soil on top. And from, from the literally 200 yards away, the farm right next door, the horse ranch, we used their compost manure for the rooftop soil. And our intention was that in the spring, we'd go and purposely plant what we wanted there so we'd have a rooftop garden, but we didn't have to. It turns out that, that the manure mix and the compost mix had four different varieties of tomatoes. It had cucumbers and squashes already in it. We didn't have to plant anything and they were harvesting from this about, a, about this time, about you know, June. And it was, it was just really nice to see this, this emergent result of using something from right there on site. So that's pretty awesome that your roof couldn't grow food, right? And it was kind of unintentional, <laughs> even though it was a long-term intention. Do you want to share some of these? Sure, we'll get into some of the photos. We also purposely um, diverted kitchen water from the kitchen sink, which was only about 15 feet from the house. And the elevation allowed us just to run this water into a trough on that roof and then use that for the irrigation. Although there's not a lot of irrigation needed in North Carolina, but it was there. So it was nutrient filled and they, they don't use soaps that would cause any issues. And it just is another way of keeping things on site. It's well water, it's from site, it stays on site, it has multiple uses between the time you pull it from the ground to the time you put it back in the ground. So that's all part of the, the lovely way of doing it. And if you reuse water that way, just you have to use biocompatible soap. Mm -hmm. not biodegradable, it has to be biocompatible, just so you know. And soap is also something that's not all that necessary when you're washing your dishes for your family and your sink and your kitchen. So things to think about. Okay. Uh, um, I thought, oh, let's talk briefly about, okay, so that's like the human health part. And buildings can also cycle um, these elements that create life in a system, right? That we want to contribute to those cycles because when cycles stop, that's when living systems die, mm -hmm. right? Everything has to be flowing constantly. Um, so we can design our buildings that way and construct them that way. And we want to think about flows of things like water, food, you know, air, organisms, nutrients, um, and then getting a little more into the human realm, things like finances, mm -hmm energy, right, and culture. And so culture gets into the building process a little bit more and also how the building is used. Do you want to touch on that now or wait a little bit? Okay, so let's just show some examples then of what Brandon has been talking about as far as natural building. Uh, are these up right now? Yes. Okay, which ones would you like to go to? I'm just talking about them. <laughs> So I'd, I'd like to ask each of you to throw a question at me. Now we've kind of covered a little bit, but what question would any of you have? We have lots of examples of what Brandon's been talking about to show you. I'm, I presume you're all kind of familiar with this already a little bit, but these are just some images we like that can show um, what's possible. You know, part of the other thing about natural building is that you can do and make almost anything you want <laughs> with these materials. Oh. You're not just limited to, you know, like what you can buy at Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, which ends up giving you like right, a lot of right angles and, you know, just things in certain dimensions. 
So you can get really creative and write, make really amazingly beautiful structures. Mm -hmm. Chad, did you have a question? Right. Other things that we, that we like to incorporate, things like this on the right, where you've got the greenhouse on the southern side of the house. This is on a slope. This is not a project that I did, but it is a project I admire. So the, the greenhouse being right outside the living room window. And this has no heating system. I read a little report on this. The greenhouse is enough to heat this in 10 degree weather, the entire house. So you simply use that solar energy for your food, your heating, comfort. And this one on the left is just, it's, it's one of those rooms that inspires you to enjoy life. And if you go into a square dark room, you know, hmm, that's not so much the way it, it does. Okay. And I'm, I, I think most people, when they see these kind of structures, go, wow, that's, that's so nice, so comforting, so real, as opposed to the, again, very square very manufactured, very processed, normal, conventional stuff. This is really creative and speaks to soul and helps comfort. And when you're in a place of comfort, you're in a place of healing. When you're in discomfort, you're not healing. You're probably doing the other, coming apart. I actually really take a lot of pleasure in finding parts and pieces from the land, stones, trees with certain shapes, you know, that they just speak and say, I want to live with this family, or I want to live with this group. I want to be here from now on and support it. Um, we'll get in a few minutes to Dr. Danny's place and describe some of that specifically. This one on the left is a great example of how you can sort of merge right outside and inside so it it seems like there's no boundary no barrier so you can have a feeling of being outside much more and energetically you know you're definitely bringing in that energy that of nature which is very beneficial for humans you know we talk about getting your hands in the soil you know tina and and others that are more adept in the farming practices can tell you about this but um, a study done in florida around 2000 with several hundred um, middle-aged and elderly couples that had uh, lost their zest for life and zest for each other. This doctor prescribed gardening and then reviewed the results and across the board, couples that gardened together and got their hands in the soil, the results, and it was measurable, their intestinal flora increased exponentially. With that, their energy levels did. With that, their issues of health started to fade away. And with that, their excitement for life and excitement for each other, specifically talking about libido for their spouses, increased and it was all measurable. So connecting to nature is what that really is. And getting your hands in the soil is one way. Natural building is another way. You're gonna get your hands dirty. You're gonna get in the soil. It's wonderful. Now this is some larger scale, you know, examples. Yeah, I'd like for Leah to step in and talk about this. These are great yeah, examples. It's get, this gets a little away from what we might call pure natural building where in conventional structures they're adding in some natural components or biophilic components, which is a great step. Okay, so I'm not gonna knock it, but uh, it's not as good as it could be, but you know, for things that already exist and you just can't change the structure, why would you do that? These are great things to do to adapt the structure to become more natural, more regenerative, right? Where you're putting life, you're creating ecosystems on the roof, right? Which is amazing. So you're increasing, you know, life on the roof and there are all kinds of benefits to that. Um, the upper left picture is like a rooftop restaurant that has an associated garden with it that supplies the food for the restaurant. So that's a great way to connect people, not just to like nature and life, but how, you know, food systems work and where their food's coming from and that whole cycle. Um, you can see the bottom left is 
an idealized image, but a lot of cities now are adopting incentives to help people and builders in particular and, and developers create green roofs, living roofs and living walls also. So Chicago is a big city for that. Um, New York's pretty big. On the upper right picture is of the New York High Line, which was an old railroad track that they converted into basically a park you know, that people can use now. Um, and these are some other images of that where, you know, you can put green stuff and life on almost any surface. And so that's a great way to adapt existing infrastructure. Uh, there's some more, you know, and it's beautiful. It helps people be healthier too, because when we're around life and green things and plants, you know, we are healthier, we're happier. Like that is absolutely proven. And once you develop that relationship, you tend to take care of it, which means you take care of the environment. And the yeah. environment takes care of you and it becomes a positive feedback loop instead of a usury, wasteful, destructive system. Yeah, it increases what's called pro-social and pro-environmental behavior. So we become nicer to each other and help each other more and we help the environment more. And this is just a totally you know, visionary kind of image about what it could look like if we take, you know, in, in putting nature, living with nature, in every space that we inhabit more seriously. You know, it could be quite a paradise. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop share and we can come back to this and, or, well, we could share the EcoHeal. So yeah, let's take a look real quick at EcoHeal. Okay, and so I'll, I'll pull that up. Give a couple Do you specifics. want any questions first, maybe? Yeah, Anita? anybody Anybody would like to interject with a question, okay. go for it. Well, hi guys, no, thanks for, for letting me take the floor. Um, just in, in reference to what you're busy with in the Appalachian Mountains, where uh, just next month, I think at the, around the same time, uh, busy with a conservancy of about, uh, I think it's about 300 hectares that's affiliated with a couple of the, the uh, game parks and things here. So I um, just wanted to make that connection and possibly have a chat with you guys in the coming weeks. Um, I'll definitely be in touch with that because uh, I think. Uh, the sort of approach that you've mentioned is going to be greatly needed and to have your assistance on that uh, with the guys on the, on the ground or, you know, just beforehand. Um, yeah, I'd really appreciate that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and so this EcoHeal project will get into the, the process of creating these structures that can be very regenerative because this, the main thing we're really trying to do in regenerative development is shift our thinking, right? Because everything we see in the world comes out of our thinking and out of our consciousness. And so we need really need to shift the way we think so that we're always thinking about living, you know, mutually beneficial relationships with all life. And that is not easy, <laughs> especially in the building industry. Yeah. Okay, so Brian's gonna describe kind of this process he went through with EcoHeal with an eye on the time. We're getting towards the end. Um, and so the process of uh, figuring out what you're going to build, where, why, and in including the community so it can serve the community and, you know, the design and the materials and ac the actual building process of manifesting it and inhabiting the structure. This is all part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those steps, you know, should have regeneration in mind. And... Uh, We'll share this EcoHeal project, which is here. I'm going to have to increase uh, the size a bit. Super small for some reason. So the beginning of the project, questionnaires went out to the, the neighborhood and responses of what they would like to have in their community, what they would like not to have in the community, um, what their original goals in this community were and how what Danny was going to put together could become part of their original goals and help them, you know, see to a next level because they had been in existence for I think about 25 years before he showed up and the land that he was going to develop was kind of right at the entrance of this subdivision. So good feedback allowed him and interaction with the neighbors allowed him to sit and develop a plan that would be appreciated by the neighborhood, not just another house slapped in and like, okay, there's another house they've just moved in, but actually something that each of these neighbors had some level of investment in. For instance, someone would never bother to ask in a regular cookie cutter neighborhood, what surfaces, what colors, what plants, what style, any of that. 
but when they gave their input and then they drive by and they see their suggestion is being built, they take some kind of ownership in that, some kind of connection is developed. And it, it was really nice to see that. Um, I, and the intention I for Danny all along was to create this as a healing space for people in the earth and have it involve people so this could be done again. It wasn't like a one-off thing. Like he, he wants this to be something people can use, you know, anywhere really. Um, so that was another regenerative aspect. So if you look uh, to the picture to the far right, you see our finish surfaces. And this is that earthen stucco, you know, a cob surface over top of slip straw. And all the wood that we put in here is, is purposely picked. If you, if you look at the walls there, you have this five strips here, and you have these the three strips here. And then if you could zoom in on this, you'd count 13 and one. So when you start looking at sacred numbers, you look at Fibonacci over to the right as a staircase. Let me make it bigger for you. You can look at the ceiling, the second one to the left, there's a mirror image of the ceiling on the floor. And you can count that as well. And you can start to recognize if you're familiar with, with sacred numbers, what these represent. So going out and picking the lumber, picking the trees, the hickory, the maple, the cedar, and purposely picking different shades, different textures, but all from the land to create the trim. If you zoom in on the door casings as well, the baseboards, if, when you get to the baseboards on the main level, it starts in one place from one tree and continues all the way through the main level. And the grains match, the edge cut is live, and people comment on how really wonderful that feels and looks. But it's, it's also because that, that baseboard which most people would just recognize as baseboard. That was a living being on this piece of land, right within a hundred feet of where it lives now for the rest of its life grew right there and was picked to be that, that piece right there to complement the piece next to it, to complement the piece next to it and so on. So lots of thought and care goes into it and you can feel it. There's an appreciation from the structure saying, Thank you. I love being here with this family, with these people, with this community. It's, it's great. It's an intimate relationship. There's a gallery with a lot more pictures. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, this picture right here, if you look, this is the ceiling. And you can count the, the you know, number of beams that come out off this. The center is actually controlled electronically with the remote control. It's, vent, it's a vent. And it's connected to the thermostat and the humidistat. So it will automatically open and close and, and evacuate humid warm air or you know, just warm air. But again, um, you can go into the gallery if you go to this website and you'll see the floor mirrors this. And the floor is made 100% from trees from the land. There's the, the flooring crew, and I like to tell this, I've taken many crews that are conventional crews and just hired them and said, I'll direct you and we'll put you on a by the hour. So there's no way you'll feel like you're losing out, but I'm going to teach you how to do natural building. Some have said, I'm not interested, but most say that sounds cool. I'll try it. And I let them know this is yet another thing you can offer. So come and learn from me. And then you'll be able to say, I can do conventional and I can do this natural product. So this flooring company came. And they're big, you know, country boys. They're just ready to get the job done and go home. But first day they come in, I talk to them. I give them a good 30 minutes on where the tree, where the wood came from. It was all from the land. It's all stacked and ready. And it was all tongue and grooved. We milled it on site and then had it stacked and ready. And they were like, oh, okay, whatever, man. We'll get started. And it's kind of rough cut. But they started laying it with my, you know, specific direction. And when they got a day or two into it, they started really enjoying themselves. We'd start every day with a few minutes of just, how is everybody? Here's what we want to do today. Appreciate this land and thank you for giving us these wonderful pieces of materials to create a beautiful structure with. They thought it was hokey pokey, you know, frou-frou, dippy-dippy. <laughs> you know, they had their jokes as they walked away. 
But again, a few days into it, the jokes subsided. They started bringing their wives to see this project. They started bringing potential other customers around to see this. When we finished the flooring and we started the, the, the finishing of it, the sanding and prepping, we used boiled linseed oil to seal it all. And I told the guys, tomorrow when we start that process, come with socks and pants you don't mind to throw in the trash or you're gonna get them just all stained and oily. You go, but there's a, there's a benefit you'll see the next day. So they came, they come with extra pair of socks and you know pants, they don't mind getting so, uh, stained. And we worked and we, we literally just pour it out and spread it and rub it in. And they're on their hands and knees rubbing this all in. By the end of the day, they're all like, man, my, my hands are soft. And one of the guys like, my knee's been hurting for 20 years. It's not hurting it today. And I've been on my hands and knees all day. I said, well, wait till tomorrow. They come back the next day to help finish up, clean up. And they started talking about how they're, because their socks were saturated with oil, their feet were then saturated with this oil, their hands, their knees, their elbows. And they were talking about how their skin hadn't felt good, but they didn't realize it didn't feel good until it felt good. And they were like, I've, I haven't, like, this is great. One of them said, my wife didn't mind me touching her for the first time in years because his hands were dry and scratchy and rough. And But this night he went home, they were soft, supple. <laughs> and that led into a whole nother conversation. But they would bring other people around and it was so great. It wasn't me then going, and this is why, and this is how. It was them saying, and this is why, and this is how. It was wonderful expansion of the information and, and growth of the community. Yeah, that was just the floor. We had so many of these. Okay, very little uh, time left. <laughs> Leah's pointing at someone, what do you want to talk about? Um, well, the basic structure was timber frame, like Brenna has said, milled on site with straw bale in the middle and then cob on the outside and the inside. So it was using a lot of different materials and you can see at the very bottom being just concrete, mm. which unfortunately it's, it's really hard to make a completely natural built structure, you know, given certain environmental conditions, like in North Carolina, you could never do that because mold would be a problem. And, you know, <laughs> you just have to use some concrete. So those are the kinds of things. Unfortunately, we still have to make some compromises. And it's, I call them a hybridized system. And it makes sense when you go through it. You just want to do the best you can with what you've got, honor the land, and create this, this really nice synergy. But it's so much better than just scraping it away, yeah. putting all your chemicals there and going, we're done. Yeah. Okay, I'll just show you a bit of the gallery because, like I said, a lot of they involve the community in this process. So they could, um, they could not just be involved, but learn also. This is intended to be, you know, a learning project for the community as well. Um, so a lot of people came and of all ages, it was like a good, you know, family kind of thing. The, the builders involved learned a ton and have taken that into their work now. Mm -hmm. um, I, do you know if any of the community members have now had natural built homes or other structures commissioned or I haven't followed through you know, to see if anybody in the neighborhood has. They're all having fun. There's a local school nearby. So a lot of classes would even go over there for some of their lessons and learn different things related to what they were learning in school. So that was pretty awesome. Um, there's like a natural built pizza oven, cob pizza oven <laughs> that Danny would invite people over to just hang out, you know, get to know each other. So not even, I mean, they would learn about the project and what was happening, but it was really like a, you know, community building event also. Uh, oh, there's some of the floor you can see. Yeah, so he floor. would lead tours and he sold it um, not too long ago, but he was always very often leading tours to educate people about this. Um, there's a little bit of the process, it's more of the process. We'll just go through these quickly. Yeah, I mean, it was great. These were just people who live in the in the community, you know, being involved in this with no real expectation of any kind of return, except that they wanted to learn about it and learn how to do it for themselves sometime. Mm -hmm. um, Danny set up a lot of experiments to 
measure things like the humidity in the house, temperature, things like that. He's very scientifically minded as well as artistic. Uh, this is measuring the, what is this measuring? <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, you can take a certain amount of soil and weigh it and get your density and determine, you know, whether it's going to be adequate for your structure. So when you're doing rammed earth, that's important. You don't want really fluffy yeah. soil. You want dense soil. There's some of the timber. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, what is this? This is the, this is the little uh, guest the house. Meditation? Oh, the meditation okay. guest house that we put together in short time. And uh, this is the result. You can see there's hardly any leaves on the trees. And it, this, this just exploded with life before we even planned to start planting. And then we went over, we were like, okay, we got a bunch of weeds to get rid of. And then we got to looking at it, we like, nope, a quarter of its weeds, the rest is fruiting vegetables. So it was great. Um, there's a little bit of using rocks from on site, right? Well, this is urbanite. Little... So oh, we, urbanite, you know, yeah. we use, if you know what urbanite is, just you know, concrete from municipal source or road construction or demolition, it's normally going to go in the landfill or go to a very expensive recycling process. We capture it and use it for retaining walls. We can use it for structure. We can use it for patios. We use it for all kinds of stuff. This is an example of using urbanite that would normally go in the landfill. Yeah. It's quite beautiful. We also incorporated vine growth in there and that becomes a living wall. And that's the commercial structure, right? Yeah. eco heel mm -hmm. so yeah first commercial like cob structure or mm -hmm. hay and cob happy people <laughs> <laughs> and i gotta say yeah. well over oh, there's half the roof. Yeah, there's awesome. the roof just about a month man kids love this roof they would just go up there and just you know just love it and hang out and read or do yeah. crafts or play whatever in their own little gar sky garden but over half of the people that participated in some aspect of this project had no background in construction whatsoever, none. Oh, they planted a lot of food plants, the food producing plants um, all over the property. On site. Uh, this is like that forming system for rammed earth. If you take a look, so in the middle of this photograph, you'll see these forms and these connectors down below, that's the resulting rammed earth. And you just, every day, we would do an entire perimeter, compact it all, and move the forms up another level. Next day, so within two weeks, we have the entire exterior form walls complete. Yeah. Windows already installed, everything, because it just goes up like that. Just gonna let it dry. Okay, what else? I think that's pretty good. There are a lot of pictures on here. We'll just stop now, but you can go and look <laughs> and see all the wonderful stuff that's happening. Um, and it, it, let's ask yeah. a couple of questions. Yeah, we, it's, it's about time, so yeah. some questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, just for the link in the YouTube video, what, what's the link to? It's ecoheal.org. Okay. Um, well, I had a question, but it's like, uh, it might be a, for a whole nother talk entirely, but like, how do we take something like this and apply it on a grand scale, right? Like, um, yeah like four eight-story buildings in cities um, versus saying, no, we can't do that in my community, can't do it in my community, can only do it in one special niche community in, in wilderness. Like, um, how do we apply it to cities and neighborhoods? There are places in Lebanon, there are places in throughout the Middle East. Now it's, it's because it's been their building practices for centuries that use these techniques. Now, Dr. Danny's from Lebanon, so he's, this was, when he came here, he asked me the same thing a couple of friends got from Egypt and a couple from Poland. They said, well, this was when they're in Phoenix. They're looking around at all this massive construction going on. And they go, what is this? They're building with like popsicle sticks and cardboard. <laughs> and of course, they're talking about just two by four framing and OSB plywood, you know, oriented strand board. And of course, it looks to them like popsicle sticks and cardboard because they're used to the structures being these 12, 16, 20 inch thick stone walls that are tall, sand, right? stone, concrete, multi stories. And they can be tall that way. So you can engineer, you know, tall, large buildings mm -hmm. that are natural built, but you know, you have to know what you're doing. And generally that kind of knowledge is not <laughs> common at all. And the code, you know, people and 
the ones who approve the plans to get things built are not comfortable with it. So you need, I think it needs to start with research again, right? So it can be approved as a research project. And then once it's kind of proven, even though it's proven in other countries, you know, that doesn't matter. Like it has to be done usually in each municipality. Hmm. Uh, so it's, it's unfortunate the way the building industry as a whole works in this country. It's very, it's very much against innovation and changes for many reasons. So it's really going to have to be like in each location, like people just doing these projects as, you know, research and then proving it can work and it's safe and then it can spread. Well, it's also can... Can... go ahead. Mm -hmm has to be economical. So that's the other part. And that's why Danny created this forming system. So it could be more like cost competitive with other building techniques. Yeah. Well, Natural I, building tends to be heavy on the labor and light on material costs. Which is good, actually. That's very <laughs> good. You get more people involved and, and less destructive you know, behaviors and yeah. then you've got something good. But when you look at how the codes were written here in America, it's for fast, cheap production. But then it became fast and cheap for uh, the, the developer, but not for the end user, because the utilities are crazy compared to most places on how we, we, we've been building. It's getting better, but still. And then when you look at who benefits from the way construction materials are dispersed, bought, sold, all that, when you see who benefits from the way construction is managed, there's a control system that says, no, nope, this is the way it's quote unquote always been done here since we've had created these codes. And that's our system that benefits us and we're gonna stick with it. I do know talking with many different municipalities and working with them, when I go in and ask questions, even if I already know the answers and let them come to me with the answers that I you know, would like to present to them, it opens it up for them to say, oh, I have this idea. And, and I go, I would like to do that. So I'll do it under a, you know, like a one-off. And that's how we did it with Dr. Danny's. When we went in and said, we'd like to build these natural materials. We have an engineer on board. We have contractors that can do this, but you don't have anything in the code that addresses it. What could we do? And we knew what we could do, but we left it with them. And they came back to us and said, well, do this, this, and this, and we'll work with you. And we did. So it was the, it was the first commercial natural built in, in the state, it's specifically in Orange County. And it went well. And now they've adopted those and said, we'll allow it for others to do. So how many stories? That's, how it that's Orange County, North Carolina. How many stories is it? That one was three stories. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, that'd be great if you provide a link to that in the YouTube description as well. Um, and uh, well, you know, the Region Civics pilot project program with the 13 pilot projects, I mean, it's like, um, it's like these are, uh, some of them are sovereign communities that can mm -hmm. do plant medicine mm -hmm. and create their own currency and, and without SEC intervention and, um, and not have building codes. So these would be great places to demonstrate. Yeah, that would be great. And our indigenous communities all through the, you know, they own an incredible, um, you know, that they're designated, um, it's their land. <laughs> and yeah. so it might be interesting to, you know, work with some of these indigenous communities in a supportive way. Yeah, so, we're trying, we've been asked to, the issue is usually a lack of money. <laughs> yeah, it's always lack of money. Yeah. For and sure. so they want to just put up things that are cheap and fast and easy and that usually that's, means mobile homes tough. and those last for 20 years and fall apart and become a bigger you know eyesore bigger concern than if you had done nothing at all oh yeah oh it's 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 awful but well, solutions are there we're getting to it yeah, yeah. And that's why yeah i think working with the economic systems and creating avenues to be able to like you know create our own bottom-up kind of economy flows i think would mm -hmm. help in that. I would just say lack of fiat money. You have there's a lack of fiat money for this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah lack of fiat money. <laughs> I mean, construction that's huge because a lot of people who work in construction are literally surviving like paycheck to paycheck, and yeah. so if they don't have you know fiat money, it's just not going to work for them. <laughs> so we yeah, like creating those alternative economies with alternative currencies is going to be huge for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I could, I could talk 
hours upon hours, give example upon example. This is like not even the tip of the iceberg. This is like a little edge on the other on the side of the iceberg. But here we are. Yeah. And Tina, you had a question. I was just curious if you've integrated any of the um, the um, the um, climate battery technology into your building. So yet, yeah, have you investigated that? Where you go, you go down below the um, freeze line and you do an air circulation through oh, the climate the battery now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I I develop what I I That's call cool. that passive geothermal air conditioning. Okay, there it is. <laughs> and this was the first time I did that was around 2007, 2008, where we took conventional piping and put it underground about 10 inches below your minimum of temperature, massive temperature differential. So you had a pretty consistent you know, temperature gradient. This was in Florida. And we wrapped over a thousand linear feet of one inch piping around the foundation of this 6,400 square foot structure and then pipe that with a, a slightly antifreeze treated water coolant into a truck radiator with a 12 volt fan, okay? And this was in the utility room. This was connected to the ducting system throughout the house and <clears throat> ran it with one solar panel and one 12 volt battery for just continuous 24 hour use if necessary. And we found that in the spring and in the fall, it decreased utility uses by as much as 62%. So that heating and cooling delta T, the differential between being 98 degrees outside and 80%, 85% humidity, but inside we're using that ground temperature that consistent to lower the delta T. So then the, the powered cooling systems would kick in less often. And it was well worth it. It was something around $700 of materials and made a huge difference so, and, and then I've designed that for others and it's a very effective system. Yeah. So if that's what you're talking about. Now I've also um, utilized things like water batteries. So with a solar and here in North Carolina it's easy because we have slopes everywhere. So a water tower, even if it's just a, you know, a 500 gallon container or cistern with about a hundred feet of difference between the, ba the, the, the lowest point and the highest point, during the sunny summer hours, you've got a solar uh, array there that's charging this three amp pump. And we, in this line, every, every 28 feet, we put in a small three amp pump. And those all day long by solar power would pump that water and fill the 500 gallon tank. And then as the sun went down, it'd stop and the check valves would kick. And then when you wanted power in the house and the batteries got a little bit low, they'd kick open and it would reverse the flow and turn those three amp pumps and recharge the batteries and lights would come on in the house all night long. Next day, sun comes up, recharges the battery. And this just is free power. You have an upfront, I think the expense on that was around $1,400 of materials. So you offset, you know, thousands of dollars of fossil fuel generated power by just throwing a, a little bit up front, creating a system where you have an on-site battery and it lasts for a decade or more before you start replacing little parts and pieces. So yeah, that's, if that's what you're talking about, that's a system that's easy to incorporate when you sit with the place and place says, I have this resource, utilize it. We'll have fun together. Yeah. I can't wait till you guys spend some time here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the 100 acres in the mountains, we just recently found a continuously flowing stream. So uh, coming right out of the side of the mountain. So it's a, a good spring. And we'll utilize that for drinking, bathing, but we'll also incorporate that into some power generation and irrigation. Yeah. And the more you can use, the more you can interact with the water, the, <clears throat> the more intimate the relationship is and the more everything benefits. If you're just using it to flush a toilet, and that's it, you kind of done a big disservice to the water, the land, the, the way it came to you, the way you give it, give it away. But you shouldn't use water to flush a toilet. No, I've been saying that since I was a child. I think we're insane to flush our toilets with drinking water. So guys, are you guys utilizing compost toilets yet? Yeah, we've we've done that a few times. I taught a course at a university just last year and built one on their their ag 
uh, campus. Nice. So that, that was really nice. And it's, it's one of those things that if it's incorporated through like educational or research, right. you can get around the local codes and they just step back and go, okay, great. It's on you, not on us. And yeah. Yeah, Most I'd like to explore doing it as an art installation for a small yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Those exemptions are great. Yeah, let's play with that. Local municipalities love it. You just have this certified letter that says this is for exhibition mm -hmm. and experimentation or education. It has nothing to do with the code enforcement coming and checking it out. And they go, okay, we're released of liability, go for it. Most unit municipalities are open to the, that. And it alleviates yeah. them from the responsibilities. Okay, can't get rid of the chat now. Anyway, okay. um, I just wanted to share one last thing. This is it. Oh, here it is. Okay, um, just remind you of our courses in regenerative community development, regenerative leadership, and we will be offering natural building. We really are just looking for a place to do it. <laughs> well, we're already authorized so, to do some um, in the 200 acres. It's a bit yeah. remote. It's about it. probably uh, 15, 20 minutes to a convenience store, but it's also about 30 to 40 minutes from a decent little town in the Appalachian Mountains. It's on a lake, so it's a great place. We've got 2,500 linear feet of, of water frontage, so you can jump in the lake anytime you want to. But 200 acres and it's a mountaintop. The difference between the lake level and the highest point on the property is around 800 feet. So plenty of good hiking, but we're going to start breaking ground once I get campsites established. Maybe one or two small structures will start opening up for people to come and learn. They can camp and rough it primitively until we build some structures that make it more comfortable. But they can learn and the practices along the way. We can also collaborate with people who want to do natural building where they are in their communities and you know we could come and help them with that and host classes so people can learn in the community and others and they get structures built so it's mm -hmm. co-benefits so if you're interested in that please do reach out to us okay um yeah and we'll just wrap it up yeah yeah we'll so thank you brandon for sharing with us oh you're welcome